Yeah, let's start directly by just asking a very straightforward and major question. Um, is BRICS Plus challenging the US-led international order? Uh, yeah, no, I think it definitely is. And uh, I think you know, not only does it challenge it, I think this is the main purpose of it. Uh, because, uh, uh, but, it, but I always make the point, it's not intended to be anti-American. It's supposed to be anti-hegemonic, which is uh, yeah, important to differentiate. So uh, as we all know, after the Cold War, the United States established uh, an international system based on hegemony so effectively the system it built within the west after world war ii in which it would be representing the dominant industries technologies it would be the uh, dominant naval power controlling the key uh, maritime transportation corridors you know it would dominate the imf world bank the dollar would be the reserve currency so this economic foundation for empire plus the military power to be the uh, only major security a provider. This was the foundation of a unipolar world order. Now, the objective of BRICS um, is to move beyond this because uh, for, for many reasons. For one, the US has exhausted itself. It's just that the international distribution of power has shifted dramatically over the past 30 years. The world is no longer American-centric. So if you look at the BRICS country, for example, they're uh, share of uh, world uh, GDP, especially in terms of purchasing power parity, is now much greater than not just America, but uh, the G7 countries. So for this reason, the inter international distribution of power is no longer represented by a US-led order. So what the objective of BRICS is, is simply to uh, create an alternative system. Uh, so um, you know, to cooperate exactly on these th key issues, to develop their own security, well, sorry, not military security, but economic security. So uh, have their own, uh, well, I guess, safeguard their own supply supply chains by having uh, cooperation between each other's tech sectors to this, to develop this uh, Belt and Road Initiative, as long as uh, as well as uh, the the other initiatives by China's partner countries, which would they would like to complement it, and of but course, develop new banks and. Their own, the, try to trade more in national currencies. But a payment system is quite important because there's two big things which happen when a hegemon declines. Uh, because when the US was all dominant in the 90s, it was somewhat comfortable in this role, right? It could do, uh, it, it could um, uh, initiate trust by promoting a liberal economic system. After, uh, when you see the US in relative decline, what does the hegemon do? It tends to try to prevent the rise of others' powers so it would preserve its dominant position. So you see them now going more after uh, Chinese tech sector. They're you know, stealing the sovereign funds of Russia. So they're doing all these things. And as a result, you see the rest, uh, even uh, you know, friendly countries, countries to, uh, to the US, such as India, would still like to have alternatives. They don't want to have all their trade and economic activity dependent on the US. So that's essentially where BRICS comes in. Uh, to have a, a new parallel economic architecture, which is less dominant, less uh, reliant on the whims of Washington. Okay, so why would you say that this amounts to a challenge of the U.S.-led international order? Is it is it because BRICS will build a parallel architecture that is separate, uh, and that we will, in some sense, see the formation of two worlds coexisting? Is that the challenge? No, the, well, the, the the challenge is that the, the the U.S. developed a system where it 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 considers security to be dependent on the U.S. being the only superpower, the only the the dominant state in the international system. So, for example, uh, was it uh, two three weeks ago? One of the, the spokesperson for the uh, for the White House is it? He came out and argued that uh, you know anyone trying to create alternative payment systems to SWIFT, mm -hmm. who use other currencies than the dollar, they are threatening democracy because if America is not uh, dominant and people aren't using the dollar, uh, it will enable authoritarian power. So essentially, they see any decoupling from the United States as a as a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is. Um, uh, yeah, this is why they see it as uh, yeah as a threat to them. Okay. Uh, again, it doesn't have to be a threat to the United States, but if this their entire system is built on the idea of everything is America centric, any alternative to this would then challenge this model, and uh, this is the main concern for them.
Okay, but what do you put into, or would you say that the BRICS is actually trying to decouple from the West or decouple from the United States? Is that what you're saying, that there is a process of decoupling? Well, to a certain extent, but decouple means you sever all your ties. I, I don't think that's necessarily what they want. Uh, actually, I know that's not what they want. Uh, even countries like China, they don't want to. They don't want to drop the dollar completely. The, the dollar provides a lot of good uh, liquidity as well in the system. Uh, they hold a lot of dollars, so nobody wants to see the dollar crash. But it's also when uh, the entire international economic system depends solely on the stability of the United States and the United States become increasingly unstable, uh, both in terms of being economically exhausted, overextending itself, too much inflation, but also weaponizing its own financial system against adversaries, uh, you know, going after the supply chain, stealing their sovereign funds. What do you do? There's no, there's no stability at all then. Mm. So, uh, so the goal is to reduce dependence on the US, to mm. diversify partnerships. Um, you know, it's uh, if you wouldn't bring it down to a personal level. Imagine if you're, if you're, um, you know, you're a, you're, a, you're a business who sell to other businesses. If you only have one client uh, or one importer of your main product, uh, you're gonna be hundred percent dependent on them. This is not a good ideal situation, especially if you're being bullied and you notice that they're not doing well anymore. So you want to diversify, and but it does mean that they don't want to do business anymore with the Americans. Indeed, I think most countries around the world. Uh, believes that the U.S. Uh, is an important contribution in the world, one an important power which should be accommodated. Indeed, if you try to create an international system without the United States, it would be very unstable. It would be very disruptive. Uh, mm. It's it's a bit like in Europe trying to create a Europe without Russia. Immediately, mm. you create or an Asia without China or a mm. world without the U.S. Mm -hmm. You will have a lot of instability immediately, and this is. Uh, uh, no, in no one's interest. So I think the main purpose is therefore diversification. Mm. Would you say that this purpose has always existed there, or is this a purpose that they have developed as a result of the pressure against Russia, for instance, with sanctions and exclusions uh, following the uh, war in Ukraine or the invasion of Crimea? Well, it's been a, a goal for some time. Um, I know in the late 90s, after when, when NATO began to expand in 99 and we bombed Yugoslavia at that point, uh, the Russians, they started reaching out to India and China at that point, suggesting, listen, we need multipolarity. We should uh, establish alternative uh, economic institutions. But at that point, neither the Indians nor the Chinese uh, either had the capability or the willingness to openly put such a challenge to the United States. I think a lot of things happened in 2008 and 9 when you had a global financial crisis. This is when the Americans approached the Chinese and said, listen, we borrowed too much and spent too much. Now our banks are going bust. Uh, what you have to do is lend us even more money uh, so we can uh, you know, spend our way out of this trouble. And if you don't, we'll, uh, we'll borrow it from the Federal Reserve. So effectively blackmail. Either lend us more money or we'll print the money and... Uh, diminish the value of your existing investments in us. So this is the main problem. At this point, this is when the Chinese began to say, listen, we have to prepare for a post-American world. The, the American, uh, the international system organized around the, uh, America's perpetual economic dominance. It's no longer sustainable, so we have to create an alternative. While the Russians, uh, at least Putin, in his even more aggressive language back then, argued that the US dollar had become a leech. You know, it was sucking the the blood out of other economies, which is a uh, more of a crude way, I guess, to mm -hmm. refer to rent seeking. Uh, mm -hmm. But nonetheless, uh, this is when they really started to look for this around 2008 and nine. And then of course the Chinese uh, by 2013 and 14 began to announce their Belt and Road Initiative. By 2015, the Chinese launched their uh, goal of China 2025, in which they would dominate the main uh, technological uh, institutions. The same year, they also developed SIPs, a Chinese alternative to SWIFT system. They began to experiment more with the trade in national currencies. And uh, all of this happened at the same time as the Western country when we toppled the government in Ukraine. For the Russians, this was a clear sign because until then, since the days of Gorbachev, they had envisioned a greater Europe that is uh, common European home. They would integrate with the West. In 2014, 
this whole illusion just uh, died. Even the biggest supporter of a greater Europe said, you know, it had been a utopia. It's never going to happen. Uh, if it, if the Europeans wanted a common Europe with us, they would have used Ukraine as a bridge, not make it into a front line instead. So the Russians then in 2014 converted or changed, uh, moved away from greater Europe and embraced what they call greater Eurasia, which they reorient their entire economy towards the east. Mm -hmm. And this happens at the exact same time as China are building their alternative tech centers, their own transportation corridors, their own banks, payment systems, and the whole alternative. So China and Russia really forms the center of this. And then other countries begin to gravitate towards it because uh, everyone would like uh, alternatives. And uh, again, the, with 2022, of course, this is when things really get out of hand because the West cuts off Russia from SWIFT. Uh, it sees uh, about 300 billions not just freeze uh, the sovereign funds of Russia, but then they begin to steal it as well, mm -hmm. uh, taking the proceeds from their assets, which is yeah theft, uh, legalized. So now all the countries begin to panic. The Chinese know that they're going to be next in line because the Americans, they're the main adversary of America, so they will come for them. Mm -hmm. But even countries mm -hmm. like India are concerned about secondary sanctions. Mm -hmm. So you see this, um, then they begin to shift more towards national currencies. They no longer want to be too dependent on American banks or a SWIFT system, uh, Western supply chains, even the small things like uh, gold. Uh, they, they they don't even want to buy paper gold anymore. Mm. Now they mm. only want to buy physical gold, which mm. they can hold because they don't mm. trust that the West won't take it. Mm -hmm. And they don't even need the gold in Western banks and vaults. They, they instead now ask to have all their gold shipped back home. So the Indians and Chinese and others are now, you know, building uh, storage vaults in their own country they're shipping mm -hmm. the gold back very mm -hmm. expensive affair mm -hmm. but they don't they don't trust that the, their gold even their gold will be safe in the west anymore because mm -hmm. you know the british took the gold from the venezuelans uh, we <laughs> we we begin to plunder yeah. so they're afraid yeah. uh, the west is going rogue and this mm -hmm. is why the trust is gone mm -hmm. which is why this is all intensifying this push towards diversifying away from west so this uh, the Ukraine war has had a uh, intensified this to a huge extent. Mm. Yeah, you you mentioned uh, alternative payment systems, uh, national currencies, de-dollarization, and so on. Uh, do we actually see de-dollarization, or is it just an ambition? Can we actually see a diminished role for the dollar, or is it still just rhetorical? Oh no! If you look at the trade between the Chinese and the Russians, there's hardly if any dollar left between the Russians and the Iranians. There's no dollars almost. Uh, there's also ambition between the Indians and the Chinese, the Russians and the Indians. And of course, they kind of were the innovators, if you will. But then you see, uh, you know, when the Indians begin to deal with African countries, they also now started to shift towards national currencies, mm -hmm. even though none of them have any conflicts with the West. So mm -hmm. there is a there's a very steep, uh, there's a learning curve, but it's becoming mm -hmm. uh, more and more countries are jumping on it. Okay. So there's a... Uh, yeah, there's so, an interest in, in doing this. So this bilateral trade in national currencies, is that is that only uh, a good thing? Is, is, the, is Are there only benefits connected to trading in national currencies or are there downsides as well? Well, it's, a, it's much more convenient, I guess, if you have one currency to trade within the world. Uh, if everyone just uses dollar for everything, uh, we will, we can see why it would be, a, it, it could be a common good, a benefit for everyone. I mean, um it's uh, otherwise you would have to hold all these different currencies around the world um uh, yeah it, it the whole system becomes uh, a little bit more complicated uh, which is why it was kind of a common good when the us dollar was uh, trusted and stable but uh, but so there are benefits i wouldn't deny that there's no benefits to having one common currency which everyone uses the problem is this puts a lot of responsibility on whoever can print it because if you can print the world currency, then you can uh, essentially export or tax the whole world. Keep in mind that when you print money, it's a form of taxation. You introduce new money, uh, but it diminishes the value of all existing money in the system. Mm. So if you export trillions of dollars around the world, which other central banks hold, and uh, now you're printing another trillion at home for America to spend, the, the investments by the entire world is then diminished. So the Americans can tax the entire world to run an empire. And uh, so this is uh, this is acceptable to the extent they're modest or moderate in their inflation. 
But as you know, the U.S. has severely overextended itself. Its strategic commitments, uh, by no a stretch of the imagination, is uh, uh, its commitments are not matched by its actual income. So they're running these huge trade deficits. They're borrowing too much money, and uh, it's yeah the party's coming to an end. And if that's not bad enough, you also see that Americans are weaponizing their own financial system. So uh, yeah, cutting countries off. And for countries like China and, and Russia, they're effect effectively being taxed to finance their own military containment. Hmm. Uh, this is a very yeah, ridiculous uh, uh, yeah, way to run an economic system. So the, the Chinese are very quickly moving out of it. And you see this not just moving away from uh, you know using the dollar in trade bill with other countries, but when they get their proceeds from the investments in American bonds, they don't do rollovers anymore. They take the money out of the US and they, they still have the dollars. They just lend it to other countries around the world and they, they don't want to have any more assets in America. They're pushing out very quickly because they know they're next in line to have uh, their funds and sovereign funds seized perhaps. And uh, yeah, God knows what else they will do. Hmm. Oh, so, so when India is um, uh, buying a lot of oil from Russia and paying in rupees, Uh, what is Russia doing with all of those rupees? Yeah, well, that's one problem. Um, again, another problem. If if everyone deals with dollars, if I'm, if the Russians get a lot of dollars from the Indians, they can use those dollars somewhere else. Uh, the problem now is uh, the, the 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 Indians are buying a lot from Russia, and the Russians aren't really getting that much from India yet. So, which means that the rupee accounts are building up in, Yeah, exactly. in Russia. So, Mm. so, the, the, so this is a challenge. And again, this is why it's often beneficial to have one, one currency. So this is one of the challenges that, uh, <clears throat> that has to be resolved. But most likely you're going to see a lot of Russian investments into India simply because they have to spend this money somehow. So, but uh, no, again, it's a new system. It's not, it's not uh, perfect, obviously. It has a lot of problems and challenges to be overcome. Mm. But um, and this is why often countries will be a bit hesitant. But given that uh, the trust in the United States is collapsing now, uh, it's uh, yeah, people are countries are experimenting with different uh, possible solutions. And uh, yeah, keep in mind the uh, the Indians are also they're buying a lot of oil from Russia. Much of it they're selling back to Europe though, because <laughs> in Europe we don't want to buy Russian oil, Yeah. Yeah. uh, which we think is immoral. But if we Yeah. buy Russian oil from the Indians It's at okay. a much higher price, or industries are not competitive anymore, and we lose out to the rest of the world, then that's apparently very moral. So it's um, it's uh, yeah, suicide by virtue signaling. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Mm, yeah, it's a very interesting phenomenon. It should be studied more. I mean, Germany in itself is a very interesting case study uh, on so many different fronts uh, and now experiencing a political crisis. But yeah, we, we, let's not talk about Germany now, but uh, a very interesting um, political developments around the world. But I mean, the difficulties here, yeah, I can see the difficulties between India and Russia because now Russia has a lot of rupees and what is Russia going to do with all of those rupees? It must be a little bit easier trading with China because China might buy oil and gas from Russia and then Russia can buy a lot of things in China uh, that they need. Uh, but there's not the same complementarity with India, I suppose. So there might be frictions uh, in this system of trading with national currencies. Uh, that they have to overcome somehow. Uh, but yeah, there there is still no talk about developing a BRICS currency, right? Well, I, I, a BRICS currency has some problems, uh, a challenge. Um, well, one of those challenges, uh, again, on the topic of India, because uh, often I um, uh, yeah, speak to different Indian officials and they always make the point that if you're one, one currency, uh, you know, that would yield a lot of political power. So it would effectively be a Chinese currency. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, this has also been the experience for For Europe, if we, you know, if we share a, in the EU, that is, if you share a currency, then uh, in other words, you have a, a monetary union, then you really need a fiscal union. And to have a fiscal union, you need a political union. So mm -hmm. it, it it becomes almost a political power grab. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so again, a BRICS currency would effectively be very Chinese dominated. So I think uh, a more reasonable solution would be Uh, like special drawing rights style and SDR or mm -hmm. yeah, basket of currency. 
I know something along those lines. I'm not quite sure what. Uh... But we're still far far away from that materializing, right? I mean, after the summit in Kazan, there was, or the declaration uh, mentioned something about feasibility studies when it mm. came to this issue, right? Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's going to be that they still need time. They have to mm. do the studies. They do the, the some uh, trial and error. The, so there's, uh, uh, I think the people expecting things overnight would probably be yeah, disappointed. Mm. Um, but also too, too fast shift is not necessarily good. Again, nobody wants to tank the dollar either, but mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a need to yeah, find the other solutions. Mm. Uh, you um, mentioned. I oh, just one one quick yeah, like yeah. the Indians they still like the dollars. Yeah. They keep often keep the dollars. They just yeah. take them into their own banking systems. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. 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 You know I understand. Uh, but but the um, the concept of multipolarity is a central concept in uh, your writing and in your speaking and so on. Um, how do you define multipolarity? Well. It doesn't become an exact exact science uh, uh, because people would disagree what makes a pole. Uh, um, you know, I have my own definition, but mm. in very simple terms, uh, multipolarity simply means the main concentrations of power in the world. So, uh, um, for example, after World War II, we ended up in a bipolar system because there were only two major centers of power. You had the United States and the Soviet Union. <clears throat> then when the Soviet Union collapsed, you only had one center of power left in the world, a unipolar system, very unusual, by the way, uh, with one center of power, uh, which was the United States. And then what happens when this one center of power? Well, it's going to uh, exhaust a lot of resources to dominate the world, to rule the world. It will uh, deplete, exhaust its own resources. Meanwhile, it's going to uh, new centers of power will emerge at the periphery, which will have an interest to work with each other. And this will be then yeah, come together as uh, independent poles of power. Mm -hmm. So in the current system, you see new poles of power being uh, India, China. Now, what is a pole of power? Mm -hmm. uh, usually, um, I often, uh, uh, I guess, define it similar as you would define a great power, which is if the most powerful system, a country in the system can uh, try to... Um, well, for example, crash your economy or, uh, or or knock you down, and you're able to resist it. That's a good test of being a a, a great power. So, for example, Russia. Uh, you know, we we thought we could defeat them on the battlefield. We thought we can uh, crash their economy, uh, isolate them in the world. None of these things work, which is a good indication that they're a solid pole of power. Even. Um, I think it was General Mark Milley in the United States. He recently pointed out that. Uh, the world only really has now three, it's a multipolar, but it's three poles of power, the US, mm -hmm. Russia, and China. Mm -hmm. um, by my definitions, I would perhaps define, also put also India in this category. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't put the, I don't see any European countries in it because they simply became too dependent on the United States. So, uh, but again, uh, other would disagree. Uh, it simply refers to one center of power in the international yeah. system, which so, other... So yeah, so the definition of the pole then is power, but what type is it? Military power alone, or is it economic power? Do you also include population, territory, and so on? Uh, because Kenneth Waltz he included uh, military strength, economic power, or economic wealth, population, territory, um, uh, natural resources, and um, he also included. Uh, uh, political competence, I think, which is uh, notoriously hard to define, uh, yeah. and he didn't really define it himself. Uh, so, so, and some argue that we should actually only include military power in the definition of the pole, uh, but you include other uh, indicators of power as well, I assume. Yeah, well, the problem with this definition is I can say, well, this is the right answer, this is the mm -hmm. wrong, but... Mm -hmm. uh, no one has granted me the authority to monopolize on uh, conceptualizing multipolarity so, mm. or, or, or powers. Uh, but I, I would probably lean very strongly towards Kenneth Waltz's uh, idea of, mm -hmm. a, of a pole because mm -hmm. uh, it, it can't only be economic power because if it was economic power, you would have uh, Japan, Germany. But these are not the poles of power because 
they have effectively become nodes in the U.S. hegemonic system. So mm -hmm. they are completely 100% uh, under uh, U.S. Uh, security guarantees uh, protection. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, again, Japan economically very powerful, but uh, because it has such an excessive uh, security dependence on the United States, it can't really act uh, independently in international affairs. It doesn't have a completely autonomous foreign policy. It will do what America says effectively. It's the same applies to Germany. So, <clears throat> so this is a these are case studies of an economic of economic powers which doesn't have the military. Now, if you have a powerful military, mm. you know you can be a you know North Korea has a good military. They got the nuclear weapons. I wouldn't call them a pole of power. Mm. So you need the economic aspect as well. So mm. it's um, uh, yeah again the definitions. Uh, can be loose, you don't always have an exact formula, but um, which is why perhaps I would put India into the categories other would not. But mm. uh, yeah, this is the general idea. Mm. Okay, uh, interesting. Uh, does it necessarily have to be a realist concept of multipolarity? Or can we engage other IR theories and other understandings of multipolarity as well? Well, you can still apply the other theories. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, well, that's a good question. I I'm not sure if there's any big uh, distinction in the theories. In general, we tend to look at the liberal theory as well. What we want to do with the political theories is explain how the world works and uh, the behavior of states. Mm -hmm. Now, realist theory tends to look at the external environment, that is, the international distribution of power. Now, from this perspective all states would more or less act in the exact same way if they were in that position. So there's not much uh, difference. All states do is respond to the distribution of power in the optimal way to increase their own security by either balancing or bandwagoning. In liberal theory, we look more towards uh, the internal dynamics of states uh, to explain how, uh, yeah, how they govern. But, uh, but whether or not the liberal or realist theorist would... Uh, define it differently uh, yeah i'm not sure if they would but uh no, i'm thinking the, more I'm but the significance more, uh, of polls i think yeah. would be more important for the realist though yeah yeah i'm thinking more of uh, potentially uh, the english school uh, theory of ir uh, where you look at balance of power as an institution uh, and you see first the institution of great power management uh, which is the primary institution and then you have a derivative in balance of power as an institution, really, so multipolarity will become an institution, uh, let's say, uh, exemplified now by the BRICS. Well, mm. I guess for me, what makes uh, BRICS interesting is, mm. uh, you know, they're, they're not into military security, they're economic security, of course, mm. but nonetheless, uh, you can, if, if, either if it's military or economic security, you can have, you have two forms of institutions. One would be the institution, uh, an alliance system, where you have, you know, two countries, or more seeking uh, security against a non-member. Mm -hmm. uh, so NATO, for example, you know, you have all these countries seeking security from against the non-members. Uh, but then you also have more collective security institutions, which would be uh, seeking where members seek security with each other. Mm -hmm. Now, this is very different. It's often argued, for example, in Europe that after World War II, uh, the European <clears throat> coal and steel became a form of security community. That is, we mm -hmm. tried to have security. The French, the Germans put them to have security with each other. Mm -hmm. After the Cold War, the EU changed fundamentally because no longer did it seek to have security with other members, but against, against non-members. So it became very different. But I think that BRICS uh, is effectively the, the latter because uh, no one, at least I don't, no one in the right mind, at least, I think, believes that you know India and China will come against America or... Um, uh, Ethiopia and Egypt will stand mm -hmm. side by side mm -hmm. against America, or Iran and United Arab Emirates somehow mm -hmm. going to unite against America. It's you know these are very adversarial countries, these mm -hmm. pairs, but they're all part of BRICS. So they're they're looking to improve security with each other, reduce the uh, political differences among each other, using this uh, uh, economic uh, integration as an instrument towards improving relations. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a 
Uh, at least I, I would put it in that category. Mm. Yeah, uh, I, I, the thing that you mentioned there, I think, is very interesting. The fact that Egypt and Ethiopia, that have a very tense relationship bilaterally, uh, they join the same organization and they stand side by side, uh, which is, uh, uh, I think, it's not emphasized enough uh, that BRICS is bringing almost two enemies to the same table. And the same thing with Iran and Saudi Arabia. Now Saudi Arabia didn't decide to join, but uh, the work China has done uh, to um, mediate between Iran and Saudi Arabia and also inviting both Iran and Saudi Arabia to BRICS. Uh, I think uh, that, that is a very important aspect of the BRICS that they bring adversaries to the same table, uh, which could be actually very good for peace and uh, perhaps avoiding a direct conflict between Egypt and Ethiopia, for instance, or Iran and Saudi Arabia. It's a very good tool. And this used to be common sense. That is, uh, you know, after the Napoleonic Wars and we created uh, uh, the concept of Europe, uh, you know, the French were defeated. We the, the goal wasn't to keep the French down and, uh, you know, rip it apart among the winners. No, uh, the French were defeated and uh, we created a new security architecture and we the, the French were given a seat at the table. So they were one of the great powers. So uh, and we would have this balance of power. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, seeking security with adversary. After World War One, it did the opposite. Uh, the, uh, um, the effort of uh, uh, yeah, the Treaty of Versailles trying to perpetuate the weakness of Germany. Of course, then you set the stage for another war, mm. and um, and I think um, yeah, uh, after the Cold War, we kind of walked in the same trap again. We tried to create a Europe without the Russians to perpetuate their weakness. Of mm. course, we predictably set the stage for another conflict. So what what, the, what I think BRICS is doing is uh, is a much more healthy option. They're not going into block politics. Again, this alliance system where all countries are divided into allies or adversaries. Uh, you have this internal power structure which becomes dependent on perpetuating conflict. Mm. And keep in mind, this was one of the challenges we had in the West with NATO after the Cold War. We actually said, oh, we no longer have an enemy. What are mm. we going to do with our military bloc? Uh, yeah, you know, this is what keeps America and Europe. Uh, we have we have to have a new reason to exist. Mm -hmm. So this was the big debate. Well, how how can we reinvent uh, NATO's uh, need to exist? Oh, we can start expanding the military bloc. We can go. We said out of area or out of business. That was mm -hmm. a slogan. In other words, we have to start military interventionism. So we have something to do with this military machine because mm -hmm. if uh, peace will break out, then there's no need to have the. Uh, military bloc anymore and then you don't have America on the continent as a pacifier the Americans don't have the Europeans as uh, uh, you know with their economic uh, loyalty unless they have the security dependence all these problems begin to emerge so this is a problem with alliances it needs it perpetuates the need for conflict mm -hmm. I think this is also why you see the United States being, you mentioned this peace negotiations by the, the Chinese between the Arabs or the Saudis and the Iranians mm -hmm. What did the, the Americans reacted very poorly to this? Because mm -hmm. if the Iranians and Arabs make peace, who's, who's going to help them contain Iran? Also, why would the, the Saudi Arabians be loyal to America? Why would they start to sell their oil to Chinese? Maybe pay in wants, uh, you know, begin. Where was the? Why would there be economic loyalty anymore? Yeah, so there's a need to keep the conflicts going, not necessarily mm -hmm. wars. That becomes very costly, but to, to keep the conflict tensions. Mm. Look at Europe. Mm. After the Cold War, what did we do? We began to talk about European sovereignty, strategic autonomy, all this mm. independence. We're going to have equal status with the United States. We begin to trade with countries, uh, you know, building gas pipeline to the Russians. America said no. The Germans did it anyway. We stopped ob obeying the Americans. And as mm. soon as we have war again, look at us now. We mm. are good boys again. We are uh, now the security dependencies can really be converted into geoeconomic loyalties. So the same applies in Asia. This is why it's a good thing to have a little bit of conflict between the Chinese and Indians. Then the Indians will fall into the American camp. They can build a block against the Chinese. Uh, my point is, this is a very de <laughs> destructive and destabilizing system. Mm -hmm. And this was our goal after the Cold War. We wanted mm. to transition beyond bloc politics mm. and create something inclusive. Uh, we failed in Europe, and now we have the conflicts uh, as a result. But in uh, in the East now with BRICS, they're trying to to avoid bloc politics. And I think that's what BRICS is going for. Mm.
yeah. Um, if I just want to continue a little bit uh, in relation to the bricks and and so on before before we um, um, say goodbye, it's getting quite late. You can see it's dark outside, and I know we're in the <laughs> same time zone. We are neighbors. Um, and it's also quite dark in this room. I should have had better light, but yeah, uh, I can I can fix that afterwards, perhaps. But nonetheless, I mean, if I continue using um, the uh, English school concepts, uh, the concept of international society, there is um, the solidarist and the uh, pluralist, um, and uh, it seems to me that uh, BRICS is a very good example of a pluralist international society. Um, you recognize the, diver the diversity in the world in terms of the diversity of regimes, the diversity of nations, the diversity of cultures, the diversity of religions, the diversity of ideologies. Uh, but it's not solidarist in the sense of there being a recognition that there is such a thing as uh, individual human rights, at least not in the Western liberal sense. Um, and and sometimes when you hear critique against uh, the BRICS and these countries, it's almost always that, that uh, there is, um, it's a pluralist club, so to speak, uh, but the solidarist attention to human rights issues, justice, individual uh, liberties, and so on, uh, we don't see too much of that in those countries. Well, what do you make of such a critique? Um, well, they have poor democracies and they have poor human rights records so that's fair enough uh and you know one can also say they should aspire to improve all of this which is also fair enough but i guess there's two sides of the coin which is uh, um, once you declare these values to be universal then you're going to have the leader of these values the the self-proclaimed champion of them uh, claiming the right to represent them uh to to represent other peoples effectively this is the problem of a uh, this is uh, the the shift towards distinctive values, if you will. This is the uh, actually the, the the key of our entire world order established in Westphalia. Because keep in mind, when you have the Holy Roman Empire, you can say, oh, well, you know, here's the for example the Catholic Church. It represents universal values, so we get to assert sovereignty over everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what you have under hegemon. If you have a multipolar system. Uh, you need um, ideas which uh, accommodates the idea of uh, uh, sovereign equality. In other words, we're all different but equals. And this is, uh, you know, in 1648, what we based the international system on, which is, uh, uh, yeah, sovereign equality between different states. Now, this is, uh, to a large extent, what they're trying to replicate now in in BRICS because they're saying they're essentially rejecting all universalism. Because once there's universalism, we say human rights are universal. Well, wonderful, NATO says. Now, you know, if liberal democracy is universal, uh, we can interfere in the domestic affairs of other countries. We can promote democracy there because these are universal values. Mm. Uh, we have the right to promote them. Uh, others can't do it to us, interfere in our affairs, because we already have great democracy. You know, we can invade other countries if there's human rights abuses. Mm. Obviously, we can't invade, uh, other countries can't invade uh, Western states for, mm. you know, doing their abuses. Mm. So it, it's only like one way. So it, the the principle of universalism also lays the foundation for sovereign inequality. You know, you can say that uh, uh, civilizing a state, having rule of order, uh, rule of law and order, all of this, this is also universal value. Well, this is the same thing from the 19th century. That is, uh, you know, the other countries we say, oh, you're not as civilized as us. You don't have the qualifications to be to enjoy full sovereignty. So, you know, the civilized the Europeans uh, can uh, in establish international system versus the sovereign uh, inequality. Uh, sorry, uh, the the inferior barbaric countries around the world. Mm. You know, the garden versus jungle. Mm. So, what what BRICS is doing effectively is saying, you know, we have. They want a civilizational diversity, saying each, as the Chinese say, each civilization has their own path to development, modernization, and it's not in any one state's interest or any right of any civilization to tell another one how they should develop. This is uh, the principle of distinctiveness, and uh, this is an idea which lays, which is, I guess, necessary in a multipolar system.
because uh, if you're a hegemon, you're not going to accept any mutual constraint. Mm -hmm. if, if you're the dominant, let's say, you know, after the after the Cold War, there's only one center of power, the United States. So you're going to accept a system based on all countries have the right to the, pursue their own path to modernity. They all have their own right to, you know, their own form of governance. No, you're going to embrace a universalist principle in which you get to... Um, you know, used to step over the sovereignty of other states. So I think this is the other side of that coin. Um, and for countries like Russia, they also noticed this because when Gorbachev attempted to, you know, reform Russia, do all what uh, the Soviet Union, sorry, and do all these the changes, what happened in the 90s? Suddenly the collect, they were the political West, mm -hmm. the, uh, essentially declared the right that, you know, uh, democratization is... Uh, you know, it should be outsourced. This is why the West can do it for you almost. You know, this is our responsibility. Mm. So it's, um, it's, uh, it has many internal problems because you can't really, democracy is linked to the sovereign state. Mm. You can't, uh, it's very difficult for another power to promote democracy in another state because yeah. then it would be, yeah. you know. Uh, so it, anyways, it, it, long, 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 long story short, it doesn't work. It demands a rejection of universalism, uh, mm. even if those universal values can be good. Mm. That's interesting. So multipolarity demands a rejection of universalism. And you also said universalism leads to sovereign inequality. Uh, I think that's straightforward and clear. Uh, so last question before we leave, that's about Trump, because I think we need to speculate about Trump before we leave. And I want you to speculate briefly, because I know it's late, uh, about uh, what will happen uh, in, its, in the United States relationship with Russia and China. So first, briefly, in China, it seems to me that there is uh, like um, a strange tendency uh, in opposite directions. Um, so China is opening up um, uh, for foreign companies for American asset managers to own 100% of mutual funds in China. So that is a tremendous opening and liberalization of the Chinese market. Uh, but at the same time, we have the, um, uh, the technological war, trade war going on at the same time and sanctions and blacklisting of Huawei and so on and so on. Um, so what do you think will happen during Trump? Uh, which of these tendencies uh, can we expect more of more opening, more liberalization for uh, U.S. financial capital, uh, or more uh, technological antagonism? And then, in relation to Russia, uh, do you expect the Trump administration to uh, be uh, instrumental in some kind of negotiation of some kind of peace uh, or? ceasefire uh, in Ukraine? Uh, and do you expect the Trump administration to open up and establish more friendly relations with Russia? Well, I guess speculation would be the key word here. Because, yeah, speculation, uh, of course, is a lot Trump, of speculation. Yeah, because yeah. Trump is a bit of a wild card. And also, uh, Trump, yeah, it's not the only variable in play either to impact these things. But uh, on China, I think... Uh, um, well, again, the, in the past, the United States used to refer to human rights abuses when they wanted to sanction China to, you know, legitimize uh, economic coercion. And these days, they kind of started to walk away from it. They're simply saying, you know, the, the Chinese are getting too techno technological advanced. Their the economy is getting too powerful. We have to cut them down in size, effectively. So, uh, I think this is what the U.S. would like to do: roll back, but. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, Trump has also been quite explicit that China is the main adversary. They have to, you know, use all these tariffs and sanctions to curb them. But but uh, you know, you can't ignore what has happened over the past few years. I think uh, much like the Europeans can't diversify away from Russia, we see the same there. That we see that the U.S. struggles to diversify away from China, but China is able to diversify away from the United States. So this makes this implies that America's efforts to, uh, you know, reshore, friendshore, decouple, de risk, mm -hmm. you know, all these words they're throwing out, uh, none of it's uh, working. Uh, the, the Chinese keep growing and America's getting only deeper into trouble. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, I'm not sure to what extent common sense will prevail, but uh, for, from my perspective, I think America should pursue some uh, industrial policies uh, to try to reindustrialize, use tariffs and subsidies to the extent they achieve this goal. I think they have gone complete overreach by trying to sink China 
they are having such a huge disruption to the supply chain that they're sinking themselves. So I think, I think they should go for a more modest or moderate uh, approach. That is, uh, uh, pursue all these industrial pulses, rebuild their strength, but do it slowly, gradually. And if, if you can accept living next to China as a peer, uh, if you don't have to try to break their economy, then uh, then uh, you can do this industrialization and industrial policies while. You still cooperate with the Chinese now. I'm not sure if Trump will reach that conclusion, mm. but uh, uh, but he's expressed um, uh, yes yeah, some some concerns. So he prides himself of being able to make a deal with the Chinese. Does mm -hmm. he need to dominate? Uh, I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think it, it really depends how how he rea how reacts to this. America doesn't really have that great cards to play anymore. They're getting into very deep trouble now with uh, one of the. concerns Trump has expressed though with China is why did they push uh, Russia into the hands of China because China mm -hmm. is now much more powerful and this is not just Trump I know Kissinger told Trump this when he was alive but this is also something I think historians will look back at uh, a remarkable stupidity for the West that is for the past uh, you know after the Cold War for decades the Russians uh, main if not only foreign policy was to integrate with the West and we wouldn't take yes for an answer and instead we we pushed away Russia towards China and now you have this powerful uh, couple there so that's mm -hmm. a huge mistake now Trump believes he can uh, break them up so I'm assuming he will offer a, if you want to break up a uh, you know a couple like this you usually appeal to the weaker one which would be Russia in this case it was the so it was China in the 70s now it's uh, Russia mm -hmm. and um play on their insecurities and they try to win them over. I think that's uh, going to fail, obviously. But uh, but if they try to remove sanctions and make friends with the Russian, I think the best thing they can do is, you know, appeal to Russia's national interest. And it is in Russia's interest to diversify its economic connectivity. They're more mm. dependent now on China than they would want to be. Mm. If they can restore economic cooperation with the Europeans and Americans, they would probably do this. Mm. So simply because it's in their interest, mm. uh, I always make the point: you can always trust the Russians to act in their own interest. But um, so I think it would be for this reason: it's to weaken China. Yeah, making peace with the Russians to, mm. is is a good approach. Uh, but I'm not sure if he's. He sees it like this because a lot of the things we do are counterproductive. Mm -hmm. You know, when we tell the Indians to stop trading with Iran, Iran gets too dependent on China. Mm -hmm. When the West cuts ties with Russia, Russia becomes more dependent on China. So a lot of the efforts to play these very clever geopolitical games, it tends to have the exact opposite effect. Mm -hmm. Anyways, <laughs> with Russia, I think uh, um, Trump will want to find a way of ending this conflict. Many mm -hmm. reasons. One, like I said, he doesn't want to push Russia into the arms of China. Mm -hmm. But also, I think uh, uh, Ukraine is just becoming a very expensive deal. Uh, it's uh, They're pumping in too much money. Uh, they, 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 they can't win the war anymore. Uh, and uh, also, I don't think, besides Trump, I don't think it's a good war anymore for NATO. Keep in mind that... Uh, when the US and UK sabotaged this peace agreement in the beginning of 2022, Zelensky at this point himself said that many countries in the West wanted a long war with Russia to not take a peace deal because mm -hmm. then they could uh, exhaust and bleed the Russians. And he argued even though it would come at the expense of destroying Ukraine. For some reason, he nonetheless took this deal. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, I think it was a good war for NATO as long as the Ukrainians and Russians were killing each other and the front lines weren't moving. But now the Ukrainian army is exhausted, is collapsing, and Russia is seizing uh, large territories every day. So it's not a good war for NATO anymore. Uh, so I think uh, there's simply an interest to end it, which is why it's not only a Trump thing. I think it's a NATO thing, uh, mm -hmm. at least a US thing. I think the Europeans, uh, I'm not sure what they want, but at least the Americans are definitely moving for the exit at the moment. They don't want to do this anymore. Mm. Um, I don't know. Uh, but uh, Trump is, uh, I mean, as I said, he's a wild card. He's, mm. uh, he's convinced <laughs> that his uh, skills in business can be transferred to politics. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just had a conversation earlier today actually with Mersheimer and he was, was also agreeing with this point that, you know, if you have a, 
deal you know if you have a business deal and you put max pressure and they don't take the deal you can walk away in the political world you're still going to have china and russia there so they're, they're mm. not going anywhere so it's uh it's this maximum pressure is not going to necessarily work also this i'm not sure if you can accept the outcome uh what the russians are demanding mm. now they're talking about freezing the front lines uh, all this stuff it makes no sense because um the russians wouldn't trust it they would see the west simply buying some time to rearm ukraine and mm. fight russia later mm. so <laughs> russia's demand is are quite simple they want to have uh, they want to have ukrainian neutrality restored they want to uh, make commitments from nato no more expansion to ukraine uh, also no more military activity no more uh, american uh, weapon systems in ukraine um, you know, limit the size of the army. And uh, this is very painful. And second, they want uh, territorial concessions that is accept that these territories have been lost. Now, I personally think that Russians might either be able to do some compromises on the territories or they wouldn't necessarily need the West to recognize these territories because they don't really care that much. The I think the main importance is to have uh, the neutrality of Ukraine restored. That's the main thing they're going for, because uh, that's that's what's seen as intensifying the security competition on their border. But this is a very tall order, you know. Even for Trump, who doesn't seem to care much about NATO and simply yeah lost all interest uh, in Ukraine, I think it's still very difficult to accept this uh, yeah painful terms. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you very from, very much for uh, for that. I think that will be the last word uh, for tonight. Uh, we need to go uh, to sleep as well. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you uh, for a very nice interview. I really appreciate it. No worries. Have a good one. The same. All the best.